Good morning. We have a few announcements. One of them is not in the bulletin, uh, but we sure want you to remember it and post it on your calendar, and please come if you can. Next Sunday, uh, January the 30th, after church, we're going to have a meal. So if you can mark that on your calendar, make arrangements to come. It's going to be chili, peanut butter sandwiches, crackers, um, can anything else that I'm missing? Oh, oh, world famous, yes, sorry. World famous uh, Clifford Reaver chili. So it'll be right after church next Sunday, January the 30th. Uh, we have one meeting this week, uh, SPRC meeting on Wednesday at 515, and uh, Joyful Noise Bell, Bell's choir practice is at 530. Um, men's breakfast next Sunday at 730, so the kitchen will be busy next Sunday. Anyone else have any announcements that they would like to make at this time? Okay, please join me in the call to worship. Please stand. Sing songs of hope and peace. God's love and power and forgiveness. Sing songs of mercy and grace. God's mercy and forgiveness frame our lives. Thanks be to God for all God's love and mercy. Praise, Praise be to God for the healing power, power that extends to each one of us. Amen. Good to see everybody this morning. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Keep coming. We're going to go to the Lord. Either you're late or I'm early. <laughs> it's good to be here this morning, and we're just going to go to the Lord in prayer because he's got something for every person that walked through the door. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for this absolutely beautiful day. Thank you, Father, for the sunshine that's popping through. I pray, Father, that as we go through this service this morning, that you give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say. And I pray blessings, Father, will flow through this building. For those that came in with a weight, I pray that weight be lifted before they leave this service today. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please remain standing for the affirmation of faith, number 881 in your hymnals, or on the screen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I know you're used to hearing David, but today you've got me, okay? Um, number 98, to God be the glory.
Anybody have a joy they'd like to talk about? Anybody? You what? I know. Praise God for that. It's above freezing today. <laughs> Amen. I'll second that. <laughs> May not be a lot above freezing, but pretty much it's just wonderful. How about concerns? I do want to mention, uh, David texted me. David, that should be up there leading the singing. <laughs> he is, uh, had some more gallstones, uh, kidney stones removed, uh, 13, I believe he's told me. So he can't drive for five days, and he said, but I will be back. <laughs> so, but he would appreciate some prayer because he said this, you know, I'm sure it was painful. He didn't use that word. I'm using that word. But I'm sure that wasn't easy. Anybody else we need to remember today? How about, G yeah. The family of Randy Morris. Randy passed away yesterday. I just heard that. Louise Butterworth passed away on Friday morning. Louise Butterworth. We might want to pray for the CP Church's staff. They Most of them have COVID, and they canceled their church for today. So we want to keep all of those that are experiencing that. They're uh, not the only church that's experiencing no, that. No, yeah. and just wanted to be sure and keep everybody that is going through it uh, in their prayers. Amen. Uh, Larry Jones passed away. Some of you might remember him. Uh, I just got a call from the family. Larry Jones, and that service will be on Thursday. Uh, anybody else? What about Judy? Does anybody know, did she get home? She told me she was going home from the hospital. She's not home yet. Okay. But she is doing better. Okay. So. They'll have to strap her in if they're going to keep her there. I, <laughs> just saying. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer if there are no other concerns. Father, just, uh, you've heard all these things, Lord. First of all, I do want to pray for the CP Church, for those members, and, and not just there, Lord, it's in every church, but the COVID situation, I just pray, Father, that we come through that quickly. I pray healing, virtue flow. Uh, I pray, Father, also for... Uh, David, as he's getting stronger, I just pray you bring him back quickly. I pray for the family of Randy Morris, Lord. I just, 
I hated to hear that, and I know that you have your hand on them bringing comfort. I pray for the Louise Butterworth family. I pray for Larry Jones family, and I pray comfort for them. And I pray, Lord, that you come alongside with, uh, with Judy and just strengthen her so she can get back the way she needs to be. We thank you for her. Lord, I thank you for every prayer, every joy, every concern. Lord, you hear it all. And Lord, for those that didn't speak it out loud, but their families are experiencing difficulties, I pray for them. Lord, we just thank you right now that your hand is on us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. And we're going to do the offering at this time. So if you have tithes and offerings, we want to bless them unto the Lord. So, Father, we just ask right now that you bless this offering for the furthering of your kingdom. I pray that we give generously and give from the heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Remain standing as we sing Standing on the Promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises 
me revved up. <laughs> I'm looking out there at, what is it, Crossroads Community, no, Cornerstone Community Church. That's who you are. Corner, if I remember, we're the three C's. <laughs> I hope nobody narrows that down. It makes me narrow that down for a while. It'll take me a, a bit of time. The message today is not what it is in the bulletin. For those of you who noticed, it's last, that's last week's message. The scripture's right, but the message is wrong. The message is forgive, not me. That's the name of the message this morning. Uh, how many of you know we all need to hear a message on forgiving? Because we have great opportunity to fit for forgive all throughout our lives. I want to start with a story today. It was a woman and her grandma. And they were, oh, she was a very forgiving religious soul. And she was sitting in a rocking chair, just a rocking back and forth. And the young girl says to her, you know, uh, so-and-so in our family, he just no good. He's no good. He's completely untrustworthy, not to mention lazy as all get out. The grandmother's still rocking. She said, yes, he's bad, but Jesus loves him. And the young girl said, I'm not so sure of that. And the grandma says, oh, yes, God loves him. And she rocked a little bit more. And then she said, but Jesus doesn't know him like we do. <laughs> How many of you have family members like that? <laughs> they don't, he doesn't know him like we do. Well, if I were to guess, I would say most, for most people, there's somebody in your life It's very difficult for you. They've wounded you, and, and, I, and you struggle to forgive, but I... I was listening to Joyce Myers one day, and she said this. I thought it was interesting. She said, do you know that in my conferences, whenever I ask how many have got unforgiveness against somebody, it will always be from 75% of the people up. That is a huge amount. And that goes against what the Word of God says. Now, uh, unforgiveness is like... We, it's like we're drinking poison and we expect the other person to die. It, it's like holding poison in your hand and you think, I'm not letting go of this unforgiveness. That's like poison in your hand and it does two things. Well, it does more than that, but two main things. The first one is 
that seeps into your whole body. That unforgiveness will turn into bitterness and anger. And before long, you eat with it, you sleep with it, you wake up with it, you go to bed with it. it it's always on your mind. The other person sleeps fine. They're doing great. They're not upset. You are. But the other thing, and that medically will mess you up. Uh, doctors will tell you that can bring heart disease, it can bring stress, it can bring stroke, because you're stressed in a stressful situation for so long. But the other thing it does, it messes up where you can go. How many of you have pulled up to a restaurant and looked and thought, there are cars there, I'm not going in. Uh-uh, nope, nope, not staying there. Or you go to a, a, a gro somebody told me that they, they go to Walmart, check out the parking lot, and if their car's there, they're not stopping. They keep right on driving. Now, that's unforgiveness. And they don't want to face the person because they have all that in their heart. Well, everybody has problems letting things go. I don't care who you are. We all have trouble with that. You know, I was telling them in class, my, my Aunt Mary, God rest her soul, my Aunt Mary one day, and I, I was probably 16 years old at the time, and I was visiting Grandma Wilson across the street, and she and Grandma were sitting on, Grandma, on Aunt Mary's porch. They live right across the street from each other. And I left Aunt Mary's, and I walked across to Grandma's, and I heard my Aunt Mary say, have you ever... See, ever seen a bigger behind on anybody in your life? I was 16. I'm 72. I never forgot that. Never. Do I hold it against her? No, she's dead now. But, but I thought, why would you say something like that? So every time I see somebody with a big behind, I think, well, Aunt Marriott, you're wrong. You're wrong. That's bigger than me. Now, that's pretty bad. When you look at people and think that. So, let's go on with this. You know, sometimes well, people will hurt you one time, and sometimes they're repeat offenders. And they just keep doing the same thing or saying ugly stuff or whatever over and over. There's an old saying that says, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Well, Peter must have thought that. Because Peter went to Jesus with a question. And in Matthew 18, 21 to 22, he says this. Peter came up and said to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said, I don't say seven. I say 70 times seven. I, I say, what did I say? So yeah, 70 times 7. Well, let me tell you this. Why did Peter mention 7 times? He, he thought he was doing something good because in Jewish culture, they only forgave 3 times. 3 times after that, you're out. 3 times. So Peter, I think, decided I'll double that. Throw in an extra one for a bonus. So when he went to Jesus and said, do I forgive seven times? I think he was looking for Disciple of the Year Award. I think he thought he'd really done something good. And Jesus said, no, no, 70 times seven. Jesus was not giving a math lesson. That's not he, what he was doing. He wasn't saying on your smartphone, type in every time somebody offends you, hurts you, uh, does something they shouldn't have done. And when you get to 491, you can nuke them. You can do anything you want to them because you've run out of time. That's not what he was saying. What he was saying is there, is, there can be no limit to our forgiveness because there was no limit from God's forgiveness. So if God forgave you, he expects us to turn around and forgive other people. And I realize that are, there are people in this room right now who are thinking, I sure wish I'd stayed home today. I wish I didn't have to listen to this today. Well, I want you to know that I prayed that God would bring you in this house this morning. Thank you're welcome. <laughs> you don't know what you're asking of me, Melissa. 
You don't know how this person has hurt me. You don't know how many times this person has hurt me. You don't know how many times the person's apologized for hurt me and then turns right around and does the same thing again. Can any of you relate to this? You know what I'm talking about? Sure you do. I'm going to give you a reason to forgive. And it's this. I'm going to give you the same reason Jesus gave. Forgiven people forgive others. That's it in a nutshell. Jesus loved to teach in parables. He really did. And the parable we're about to read has, uh, it's probably the absolute best uh, parable for forgiveness in the Bible. And, and uh, so I'm going to start, it's in Matthew 18, 23, and I want you to listen to this. I'm just going to read the first part of it. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he'd begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he didn't have the means to replay, repay, the Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children, all that he had, and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, have patience on me. I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion. And he released him and he forgave the debt. So far, so good, right? Well, that's not the end of the story. But, you know, they, we, we used to have debtors' prisons in the United States. Now, that was way back when. But in John's day, they were very common. If you couldn't pay your bill, bills, you ended up in that prison until your family could get enough money to get you out. So here was a man who owed the king a great sum of money, and he's demanding payment. The problem was not that the man owed money, but what he owed was staggering. It was staggering. It said he owed 10,000 talents. Let me tell you what that is. If you think you got credit card problems, listen to this. One talent equaled 6,000 denarii. If you do the math, this man owed 60 million denarii. An average worker in that day made one denarii a day. A day. So if that man worked seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, and gave everything he had to the king, it would take him 606 years to pay that debt off. 606 years. The average lifespan was 28 years old, so it would have taken him 21 and a half lifetimes to pay him back. If you want to bring that in today's currency... The average wage in America right now is $50,000. It bounces between forty-eight dollars and $50,000. In other words, if you compute that out, according to what he had, you would have owed $8.2 billion. $8.2 billion. So in other words, there's no way that man could have paid it off. And yet he said, just have patience with me. That's what we say to the credit card company. Just have patience with me. I'll get this paid off. <clears throat> Not with a lot of, without a lot of effort, you won't. But he would never have been able to pay that back. So what does that have to do with us? Every story in the Bible has to do with you and me. Every story in the Bible. You will never read a story in the Bible that it has to do with something that has nothing to do with you. Because that's the way the word is written. So if you understand the story, you know that the debtor is you and me. That's the debtor. And the debt represents our sin. We have so much sin accumulated through the years. And the Bible says that, which is the king, says that Jesus Christ died on the cross to take care of all the sin. What you've done is under the blood of Jesus Christ. What you are doing right now is under the blood, and what you will do is under the blood. That doesn't mean we keep on sinning. That means that hopefully as we get stronger in the Lord, we sin less and less and less until 
one day we're so created in his image, we will sin very little. But you'll still sin. We're human. And so he's saying, if I loved you and you continually sin against me, how can you not forgive someone else who's doing something against you? You know, it says, out of pity, the master of that servant released him and forgave the debt. That's what King Jesus did for us. If you're a follower of Jesus, you know that we crucified his son. We've broken most all of his commandments. And even though we sin every day, the debt's canceled. Let me read the rest of the story because I'm like Paul Harvey. Let's read the rest of the story. But that slave, he went out. And he found one of his fellow slaves that owed 100 denarii. Now, that was actually $12,000 in our, our money. He seized him, and he began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe me. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him and said, Have patience with me. I'll repay you. But he was unwilling, and he went and threw him in prison until he could pay back what was owed. So when the fellow slaves saw what happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord what had happened. Then summoning him, the Lord said, you wicked slave, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way I had mercy on you? And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the tortures until he could repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same for you. If each of you does not forgive your brother, you live in torment all your life. And, and it's, it's not them that pays, you're paying over and over again. You know... Um, you know how to catch a monkey? <laughs> You're looking at me like, what the heck? Where did she go on this message? You know how to carry, catch a monkey? You take a long, tall, slender jar that's got a fat bottom and you drop a banana in it. That monkey will put its arm in there, grab the, monkey, the, grab the banana, and it won't let go. It, will, it won't let go. You can come up to that monkey and you can knock that monkey in the head because it isn't going to move. It's holding on to it. That's the way we are. And we're holding on to that banana of unforgiveness and the enemy's wailing the tar out of us and we're too stupid to know what's going on. And what's going on is you won't let go of the banana of unforgiveness. That was pretty good. All right, now... <laughs> You always learn something in these messages. <laughs> when I was teaching on this at Orchardville uh, several years ago, I read this scripture, and it's in 1 John, and it says this. Whoever claims to love God and hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love his brother and sister whom they have seen can't love God whom they haven't seen. So this guy pipes up in the back of my room, and he said, I just heard this, and he said, I think it's pretty appropriate. It says, in your heart is love and hate. The one you feed will dominate. So whatever you have in your heart, you got love in there. If you use more love than you use hate, it will grow and get stronger and stronger. I want to tell a story about a, a man named Bill. The, I'm going to tell you two stories in a row. One is, it, one is true, the other one's true, but it's also in this area. But it's a story of a man named Bill. Bill was a student pastor, and he met a, a, a buddy. He was a buddy later. He met a guy named Ray in another church in Atlanta, and they were best buds. I mean, for years, they did everything together, they ate together, they had more fun together, uh, got in trouble together, but they just had a good time. And as a matter of fact, Ray is the one who introduced Bill to his wife. And so they just had such a good time. Well, th they went their separate ways. And after about 25 years, Ray contacted Bill. And Bill was right in the middle of a building project. He was building a new home. And he had 
and it was getting ready to put it all together. And, and so Ray said to him, have you got the lighting yet? And he said, no. He said, we will pay, my wife and I will pay for all the lights and the installation. Go pick out what you want. So he did. And he went, he picked it out, and he was so thrilled that Ray would do this after all these years. So right after that, not too long after that, Ray called him and he said, could I, or, could I borrow X amount of money? And it was well into the thousands. Ray didn't think anything, or Bill didn't think anything about it because they were best friends. And he said, sure, I'll loan it to you. Do you know there's a, a verse in the Bible that says don't do that? Well, he must have missed that because he loaned him the money. And the guy said, I'll pay you back in two weeks with a check. In two weeks, he sent him a check with a note attached. And the note said, please hold this two more weeks, and then you can cash it. So two weeks later, he went to the bank, and the banker said, I'm sorry, that account's been closed. Bill tried to call Ray, no response. Lines had been shut down. He never saw Ray again. And he said, that wasn't bad enough. He said, the lighting company called me and said, those lights were never paid for. The installation was never paid for. You owe that as well. So he lost thousands of dollars to this friend. friend. And then he said this, I've got two options. I can live the rest of my life holding that debt over Ray. And every time I think about Ray, I'm going to think he cheated me cheated me or I can choose to forgive Ray and release him and he can't destroy me anymore we all have a choice let me tell you about a local pastor in the area somebody called him one day and this pastor doesn't have a lot and, and the pastor they called the pastor and said how would you like to have a new bed well he thought well yeah so he said, you go down, pick out the bed, and charge it to me. He said, okay, and he did. And first month, they, they paid it. The second month, the pastor got the payment book in the mail. All he paid was one payment. By then, he couldn't take it back. And so financially, he was strapped until he could get that bed, that bed paid. People are hurt every day, every day. And we make ours always sound bigger. I'm going to tell you, if you live long enough, you're going to be lied to and lied about. You ought to, become, you ought to be divorced in Fairfield. You ought to go through one. That's an experience of a lifetime. I found out things about myself I didn't even know. And lies, that was with Jerry 1. I'm married to Jerry 2 now. But Jerry 1... I heard all kinds of stuff. And you know who hurt me the most were the good friends who would call me and say, do you know what he did here? Do you know when he did? How do you think hurt me the most? It was the friends that kept going on and on and on. You're going to be beaten up, knocked down. Uh, people will walk out of your life or they'll walk into your life at the wrong time. You're, they're going to cheat you, steal from you, give you the short end of the stick and leave you holding the bag. This is reality, people. And the question is, what are you going to do with it? Because that's what you're responsible for. What they do, that's their stuff. But you're responsible for, you, for how you hold it. Does everybody know what a trigger is? If you take a gun, a loaded gun, and I, lean, and I shoot that gun, what comes out is what's on the inside. So there's a bullet that's going to come shooting out of that. And it will accomplish what it's supposed to do. Well, that's why Satan uses triggers on us. What's a trigger? It's something that pulls up a memory. Uh, let's say I can, there's good ones and bad ones both. Um, a good one would be, uh, well, let, let me think what's a good one. There's got to be a good one in here somewhere. Oh, yeah, here's a good one. If you, uh, my, my grandma Hollinger loved Pond's cold cream. And so whenever I smell Pond's cold cream, 
or see an advertisement for it, that's a trigger for me. And I go back and I can see myself as a little girl standing next to her dressing table putting that white stuff all over my face because Grandma did it. That's a trigger. You know, Jesus had a heart of forgiveness. The number one blessing blocker is unforgiveness. We ask God to heal us, to protect us, to watch over us, and yet we're saying, no, I won't let that go. No, I can't do that. And God's saying, open your hand up and let me have it. Have you ever tried to pry a little kid's finger? If they got something in there they want, you try to pry their fingers off. That's a trick. Well, it's sort of like that with the Lord. The Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. All of us are. And so if Bill hurts my feelings this afternoon, he is fearfully and wonderfully made by the same God I'm made by. And so for me to hold ought against him, I'm just going to mark it off that he was stupid at that moment in time when he said what he said. How's that work, Bill? <laughs> He's going to be home, go home, be mad at me. <laughs> How many of you know Satan takes what God made for good and uses it for bad? He just does. Pastors, we'll be wounded by pastors, teachers, uh, next door neighbors, family, friends, and you can be hurt worse by family members than anybody else and close people. Our minds are like computers. They store memories, they store, store, they store experiences. How about a song? Is there a song that takes you back in time? Sometimes it takes us to the wrong place, but, but that could be good or bad. When I hear Kentucky rain, I think of, of Kentucky where I went to college. If I uh, smell emerald, which is a perfume, I wore that when I was 21 years old. I still remember, I thought that I was frisky then. I, my frisky days are over, but I was frisky back then. And, but triggers, words, memories, anything like that, that can, that can cause a pain and we relive it. Uh, you know, that's why if you go and you drive by a, a restaurant, you see their car, that's a trigger. It's like, oh, and it makes your stomach churn because you're going back to the time you were hurt. It's easier for us to ask forgiveness from God than it is for us to forgive other people. If you sleep in a bed of bitterness, if you've got a stranglehold on somebody and you won't let go, if you made up your mind no matter what she says, I'm not going to forgive, I know that this is difficult. But I'm telling you right now that God says you have to let things go. Don't step before me in eternity and say, I refused to forgive somebody. You can only say, forgive me, God, if you're willing to forgive other people. I want to end with this story, February the 9th, 1960, Adolf Coors. Some of you know who that is. He was a, a, beer, he was a beer magnet, actually. I mean, he went very wealthy. Well, he was kidnapped. And they shot and killed him. They found his body on a, on a hillside. His son, Ad, was uh, 15 at the time, and it just destroyed him. He hated that Joseph Corbett that had done it. He hated the fact that he'd lost his best friend. And for 15 years, he thrived in the pain and the anger and the ha hatred. And... Fifteen years later, after all this hatred, he found the Lord. He accepted Christ, and he said, God, I'm going to sell the Coors. Beer. They're, they're part of it. And he did. But he said, there's one thing I can't get rid of. I don't know what to do. I have so much hate against this Joseph Corbett. I, I don't know how to forgive him. And he said, every day I would pray. And, I, and it's a tr this is a true story. Uh, when I used to pray for my ex-husband, I'd say, God, I ask you to forgive him, and you know I don't mean it. I prayed that for years, and you know I don't mean it. I put that on the end of every prayer. God, I just pray blessings on him. You know I don't mean it. God knew my heart. He knew what was inside of me. And when I said that, I meant that. God... 
You told me to bless him. I'm blessing him, but you know I don't mean it. And then one day, all of a sudden, something changed in my heart, and I didn't tack that on the end anymore. And I really and truly wanted God to bless him and to change his life and to make him the man of God that I knew he could be. Everything changed when I did that. It was like this weight came off my shoulders. Add said, I told the Spirit, I can't do this by myself. You have to help me. Do you know that one day the Holy Spirit moved on him and said, Add, let's go to the maximum security system, maximum security unit, and I want you to talk to Corbett. He was in Colorado's Cannon City Penitentiary. And, and I Ed said, Lord, if you'll be with me, I'm, I'm going to do it. And he did. He went to the prison, and Corbett refused to see him. So he left a Bible and inscribed it with this message. It said this, I'm here to see you today. I'm sorry we could not meet. As a Christian, I'm summoned by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to forgive. I do forgive you. But I ask you to forgive me for all the hatred that I have kept in my heart against you all these years. Later, Coors said this, I found a love for that man that only Jesus Christ could have put in my heart. When we forgive people, sometimes it's just like peeling an onion. It takes a layer at a time. It's not an instant thing. Sometimes it's instant. But I'm telling you, this is something that will really damage your walk with Jesus Christ if you don't get it straightened out. I want to go to the Lord in prayer before we sing the last song. Would you please bow your heads? And uh, if you struggle with this, just slip your hand up quick, down. Nobody needs to see it. You can do it right in front of you. Hands are popping up everywhere. Amen. Father, Father. You saw those hands, and you know the ones that are lying through their teeth right now. So, Lord, I'm just praying, God, that you give us that unction to forgive, that you come alongside us in such a powerful way, Lord, just a powerful way, that we don't have to say, you know I don't mean it anymore on the end of a prayer, because you're going to change our heart and it doesn't matter what they did, no matter how horrible it is, because you're going to judge them one day. I just pray, Father, that you help us know that it's not going to ruin our life. We're just going to let it go and move forward. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll stand and sing our closing hymn, number 371, uh, verses 1, 2, 4, and 5.
to send you out into the world. Are they ready for you? No, but you're going to go out and change them, all right? Father, front to back and side to side, we ask your Holy Spirit be in this place. Father, I pray blessings on every person in this room that they will be the man and woman of God you created them to be. We just thank you for this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'll see you next week.